Hi, I wanted to discuss some of the stuff from class today on uh, Thursday the 11th. Um, first of all, we reviewed with the, um, in general with um, the basal ganglia, and the basal ganglia includes a whole bunch of areas. Um, the only one of which we need to know at this point is the striatum. There's one more that releases dopamine that's going to come up uh, when we talk about Tourette's syndrome. And there are glutamate releasing excitatory inputs from all over the cortex that all connect into the basal ganglia. And then some of the cells in the basal ganglia, in the striatum rather, some of the cells in the striatum make direct projections to some of the other structures in the basal ganglia. And then other cells do what are called indirect projections. The directly projecting neurons, when they fire action potentials, increase the desire to move. And when the indirect projecting neurons fire action potentials, they um, promote uh, a, a stopping of movement. Um, it's obviously, as with everything else, more complicated than that, but that's kind of the main idea. In the Welch study, um, we also reviewed the first question, which is just, are they able to generate a mouse that does create an um, and mimic some of the behaviors, model is the word, modeling some of the behaviors of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and in fact, uh, what they found is that with this particular mutation where they knock out or remove an entire gene, in this case the gene that codes for something called SAPAP3, which is found at many synapses, um, what they find is that something changes in the brain that causes a behavioral, uh, um, that they interpret to be like OCD, um, in particular, increased grooming, increased spontaneous grooming. Um, then they want to go in and figure out, in that same study, they wanted to go in and figure out what are some of these invisible changes? What are so, sort of like figuring out um, and, and trying to observe, um, uh, make some, some uh, uh, inferences about what must be going on in the brain. The first thing then is they're looking at these connections from the cortex to the striatum. And they want to um, stimulate them electrically, so stimulate these inputs from all over the cortex, and record the electrical responses in the cells in the striatum. Um, and they just, the first thing is just to see, are these responses stronger or weaker? And what they find is that the, um, the excitation, the excitatory response in the striatal cells, is weaker. And so what they infer then is that either there are less or fewer receptors, or there's less neurotransmitter being released from these presynaptic axons. There are either fewer receptors on the postsynaptic cells in the striatum, or the presynaptic axons that came from the cortex and are now making connections into the striatum might be releasing less neurotransmitter. Um, and so then the next thing that they do is they want to figure out which of those it is. And so to do that, they do, um, uh, instead of single action potentials one at a time and giving the synapse plenty of time to recover, they um, have two action potentials 10 milliseconds apart, boom, boom. Boom, boom. Um, and then um, what they measure is the ratio of responses. Uh, and so we already know the first response is going to be smaller. And then if there are fewer receptors, then the second response will be smaller and in the same ratio as the first. It turns out that for the wild type synapses, the ratio is about 2.5. So um, that means that the second response is about two and a half times as big as the first. And then um, so if the, if the knockout the mutant animals have fewer receptors on the postsynaptic cell, then we would expect that the second response, first response is smaller, the second response is going to be also smaller and in the same ratio, um, about two and a half times. Um, on the other hand, if there is less neurotransmitter being released, then we expect there to be more calcium buildup, um, not running out of neurotransmitters, so the calcium buildup becomes the dominant factor. And so we're going to see um, a larger ratio. The first response is smaller. The second response is still going to be smaller than the second response in wild type, but the ratio of the two is going to be larger. Um, and then that is, in fact, uh, not what they see. What they see is the ratio is unchanged. And so what they conclude is that the amount of neurotransmitter release is unchanged. And then they decide that the most likely explanation for um, the decrease in response is because of fewer receptors. We then um, discussed how there are um, many different inputs from all over the cortex in the striatum, um, but not necessarily all of these inputs are doing all the same thing. 
And in particular, we've already seen before that the orbital frontal cortex is a very important part of the brain for obsessive compulsive disorder as well. So since we're looking at obsessive compulsive disorder, it would be nice if we were able to selectively stimulate the connections from the orbital frontal cortex into the striatum. In order to do that, electrical stimulation doesn't work because all of these axons jumble together. But if we genetically alter the orbital frontal cortex neurons only, to express a, um, a protein that gets activated by light, then the consequence is that when we shine light on those cells, they start firing action potentials. And if we shine light on this bundle of axons, only the axons that came from the orbital frontal cortex have this, sodium, this light activated sodium channel on them. And so when we shine light on this, those axons, all of the axons see the light, but only the ones from the orbital frontal cortex have this modification that makes them um, uh, respond to the light um, and become active and start firing action potentials. So that's sort of a very long experimental setup, but then um, what we do for the mice is we have wild type and SAPAP3, but actually we're mainly going to focus on the SAPAP3 mice. So these SAPAP3 mutant mice, we train them to associate tones with water, and then we take away that association and watch them continue to obsessively wipe their heads in response to just hearing this beep, this tone. And so we measure the amount of wiping that they do. And what we found, uh, and then so um, there are a few possible results, but the one that they saw and the one that we're gonna focus on is if activating orbital frontal cortex inputs to the striatum causes um, the, uh, if activating orbital frontal cortex synapses to the striatum causes um, a suppression of behavior, then we will see less wiping in the knockout mice because now those orbital frontal cortex connections, we're just going to infer that maybe now we've sort of turned up those weak orbital frontal cortex connections enough to allow the mouse to break out of this obsessive behavior. And in fact, that's exactly what they saw and exactly what they infer. So now they infer that um, by, by turning up this orbital frontal cortex activity, we're compensating for the fact that those synapses are weaker, like we, like we saw in the Welch paper. Um, and now we're going to, um, by compensating for those weaker synapses, going to relieve some of the symptoms. So what they actually observe is less wiping. Um, they're, they're sort of, uh, so they, they, so that, that they argue that, that suppresses behavior, suppresses the compulsive behavior. And then um, sort of the more speculative and visible conclusions are that these were sort of compensating for this uh, underactive orbital frontal cortex connection, this weaker orbital frontal cortex connection. We'll look at another paper that actually sees something different tomorrow.